again, you know, you can't change the facts of the case. And I recognize that. But I'll tell you one of the things that makes this case especially difficult was that uh, Ms. Jordan was nine months pregnant. And so in committing this crime, not only did you end her life, uh, you ended the life of a baby that was pretty much full term. And I think it's difficult for us to imagine uh, what your mindset was that would allow you to beat a pregnant woman to death in light of, especially in light of the fact that that child could very well have been your child. We are about to watch a commutation hearing that took place in 2022. We have mic drops from Mr. O'Shea. We have mic drops from Ms. Jackson and mic drops from my favorite DA, Ms. Tracy Balbera. Let's buckle up and go. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Vaughn. Good afternoon. How are you doing this afternoon? I'm doing well. Good. So as she said, uh, well, let me introduce myself to everybody. My name is Cheryl Wanatsa. First, I'll read some identifying information into the record. Uh, then I'll ask you to verify that. And then I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Jackson as your case has been assigned to her this afternoon. Okay? okay. Ready? Okay. All right. So you are Sean Vaughn. Your DOC number is 396274. You're here before the pardon board this afternoon as you submitted an application for a commutation of your sentence. You were sentenced in the 19th JDC, East Baton Rouge Parish, to life uh, in July 1998 for the conviction, second degree murder, first degree feticide. Is that information correct, Mr. Vaughn? Yes, ma'am. All right, would you answer Ms. Jackson's questions? <clears throat> Good afternoon, Mr. Vaughn, how are you? Good afternoon, Ms. Jackson, I'm doing fine. All right, Mr. Vaughn, your case has been assigned to me, so I'll be uh, starting the questioning of you. And I just want to start with some preliminary uh, information. How old are you? I'm 53. And how long have you been incarcerated? 24 and a half years. Um, in your um, application for commutation, you mentioned the uh, second degree murder but you didn't specifically mention uh, the first degree feticide. Uh, were you aware of that? Uh, yes, ma'am, I was aware of that. I think um, the question was what uh, conviction was I seeking clemency from? Mm -hmm. And since I had already done the 15 years on the uh, feticide, yeah, I was feeling a lot. I yes, understand. Well, let's, uh, let's get into uh, the case itself. All right. I'd like for you to explain to us in your own words um, what happened in this case. Yes, ma'am. I um, became involved with Natasha Jordan uh, some years ago. And toward the end, I started to realize, but throughout the course of the relationship, I realized that um, she had a, a volatile streak. And I tried to end the relationship when I started learning that. And it, when we got to the point of that night, I met with her to try and to read. Let, 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 me, let, me, let me stop you there. Okay. What was, how long had you been in a relationship with uh, Miss Jordan? I think I met her in 92. We didn't really start a relationship till some, sometime after that. I don't know exactly when, but it was sometime after that. 92 is when I met her. I mean, give me, give us a rough idea of how long you and Miss uh, Jordan had been uh, dating or, or however you would describe the relationship. I'd say, what, four years? Four years? Four years, four and a half years, something like that. Okay. Now, um, but you were also involved with someone else. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And, and who, who, was that, who was that person? 
Okay, uh, Tina Tina Vaughn, who's my wife now, you're Tina Galantine at this time. Okay, and how long had you been involved with Miss Tina? Since 95. Okay, did that kind of overlap with your relationship yes, with Ms. Jordan? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And uh, at what point did you indicate to Ms. Jordan that you wanted to discontinue the relationship? Well, I don't know exactly when, but um, I would say probably around 90, the end of 96, around that time, at the end of 96, beginning of 97, maybe. Okay. And how did you indicate that to her? Oh, I told her, I just said that, look, we can't continue like this. <laughs> so, um, and she, I mean, I don't want to get to where I'm blaming the victim, but it's just that there was a side of her. I just want to know what your, your perspective is. Okay. So there was a side of her that um, I didn't want to deal with. Like I said, she was kind of volatile and demanding, and I wasn't used to that. And so I told her that we couldn't continue, but that didn't go over well. Okay, what does that mean? It didn't go over well. She didn't want to end the relationship. Okay, well, let's talk about her pregnancy. We'll come back to what happened. Um, are you alleged to have been the father of her child? Yes, ma'am. Um, that's what I was told, but I didn't have any proof of that. I wanted to find out for sure, but yes, ma'am. But but you were sexually involved with her. Yes, ma'am. At a point in time where you could have been the father of her child. Is that yes. correct? That's Is that correct. a fair statement? Very fair. Okay. So what precipitated your meeting with her on July 14th of 97? Well, I met with her. I wanted to try to reason with her. Okay, why? Um, I mean, tell me, tell me why you felt it necessary to meet with her. Well, two weeks prior to that, there was an incident. Um, she attacked. She and her sister attacked me and my girlfriend at a restaurant, and the police were involved. They were called, and um, that that was just. I don't know. That was just the the ultimate. For me, I thought about it for two weeks after that before I got back with her, and I said, "Well, okay, I'm going to call. I'm going to call her and meet with her and talk with her, see if I can reason with her and let her know and know on certain terms that we're not getting back together. So all of these things that she's doing, not going to make anything better. That she needs to stop. And and what arrangements did you make to meet and have this discussion with her? Okay, I met with her. I called her up. And I met with her at a place we normally go. It's down by the bridge, um, by the river. I've been there many times before. And I uh, met with her there to talk with her. And um, the conversation took a very bad turn. It didn't turn out the way I thought it would. I understand, but tell me what happened. Well, it went from, it started off calm. It, it, it did. I, mean, I was telling her how I felt. And we can't continue this. You can't continue with um, all these things that she was doing. Nothing's going to convince me to get back with her. Okay. And she didn't like it. Everything went from zero to a thousand in a second. But I want to know. I want to know the progression. I I, I want to know how it went from zero to a thousand. Well, I'm just telling her that we can't continue the relationship. I was telling her that you know, I have somebody. I'm not coming back to her. Um, as far as the baby's concerned, if the baby is mine, I will help take care of the baby. There's no problem. But as far as us getting back together, that's not going to happen. And I told her that uh, if this doesn't work out, this conversation, my next move is to get a restraining order. And that's when it happened. And what happened? Well, she attacked me. Okay, um, explain to me how she's not, okay. She's nine months pregnant. What kind of weapon did she have? Well, she didn't have a weapon in her hand. She was punching and screaming and she jumped off. She was sitting on the back of my truck and she jumped off the back of my truck and she hit me and knocked me down. And then she got on top of me. And after that, things are kind of a blur. Okay. So uh, this woman is nine months pregnant yes, and she is able to knock you to the ground and then pin you down on the ground by getting on top of you. Now, I wouldn't say pin because 
she wasn't holding me down, but she was swinging and flailing and fighting, and I'm trying to block her blows and whatnot. And okay. I remember that. So sure. how did she? How did she get killed? Well, while she's on top of me, I know that when I fell back, I reached my hand, grabbed something. I can't tell you to this day what it was, and I struck her with it. I don't know how many times, but I know that I hit her, and I mean that's just obvious yeah. from. Would you say you kind of bashed your head in with a large rock? I can't say that it was a large rock. I I don't know, but yes, I did hit it in the head. Yes, I did. And I don't know what it was. And why weren't you able to just get her off of you? She didn't have a weapon. I I don't understand. Um, Help us understand why you responded uh, the way you did. You know, Ms. Jackson, I've been trying to understand that myself all these years because um, <clears throat> I never wanted to hurt Latasha, do anything to her. And so why I responded that way, I don't know if it was because of I didn't realize where I was mentally after everything that we had been through. I don't know. Maybe it was a backup of feelings over time, negative feelings, bad feelings. I don't know because that's not me. I can't pinpointed down to why I responded that way. I've been trying to understand it for years. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so so we'll, we'll, we'll move forward, uh, Mr. Vaughn, and talk about um, the last um, 24 plus years, 25 years of, of your incarceration. Um, I see that you only had three disciplinary write-ups in your incarceration, is that correct? Yes, ma'am, that's correct. Do you remember when the last one was and what it was for? It was in 2008 for contraband. And what was the contraband? Um, I left my leather dye, we have hobby shop boxes, I did leather work at the time, and I left my leather dye in my hobby shop box and it's supposed to be stored in a flammable cabinet. That was a mistake on my part. Okay. And tell us about some of the classes you've completed. I have completed 100 hours, victims awareness, taking uh, personal responsibility. Um, I've taken substance abuse, two substance abuse classes. And right now I'm enrolled in an IC3 computing class. I've had, um, Let's talk about the substance abuse classes. Why did you take substance abuse classes? Well, I thought it was necessary. Not that I just that anything, any drugs or alcohol was associated with this, but I know that being incarcerated, if I were to ever get out, that transition from being incarcerated to going back out into the free world could be stressful. And I there's triggers, things that can cause a person to take up drinking or take up drugs and the stress of that transition, that's one of them. And so I want to make sure that I understood, you know, that, um, you know, what could possibly happen and how to avoid those things from happening. And you also took anger management? Yes, ma'am. What, what did you learn from taking anger management? Well, one of the things, and um, I felt like I needed that, trying to understand what took place that night, where my mind was, was um, when faced with a situation, you know, a person has to learn to act and not react. And I feel like that's what happened with me that night. I reacted instead of making a conscious decision to act and take certain, a certain course of action, positive course of action. And so, um, and being here too in prison, incarcerated, every day we're faced with situations that could possibly turn out to be a violent situation. And so we have to know how to handle those situations. And so taking that has helped me to learn to do that, you know, to walk away from a, a situation or perhaps communicate on a different level to de-escalate a situation. And so that's why you know, I haven't had any physical altercations since I've been in prison. You also t- took uh, taking personal responsibility. Uh, what did you learn from that? Well, just 
what the title says, taking personal responsibility. When a lot of times I've heard guys talk about their cases and their, uh, their crimes, there's a tendency to blame someone else, to find fault where well, this happened because of that, this happened because of that. You know, ultimately, we're the ones who committed the act. I'm the one who committed the bad act. And it all, it all falls on me, no one else. And had I made a different decision, took a different step, things would have been different, but it all goes back to me no matter what else happened. Uh, I see that you are a radio and TV announcer at the prison and that you've been involved in the production of um, skits and and videos, um, you did one for 100 Black Men. Yes, uh, you've also worked with other individuals in producing uh, documentaries uh, from the prison. When did you start doing that kind of work, uh, Mr. Vaughn? I started in March of 2007. And uh, how did you get involved in that particular area? Well, actually, someone talked me into it who used to work with the television station. He kept at me for a couple of months. I was an inmate counselor at the time, and I was comfortable where I was. But he asked me to come and try it out, and I did. And um, I saw the potential for growth and the potential to learn a lot. And so I stayed. OK. And what uh, prior to that, what was your job? You were an inmate counsel. What other jobs have you uh, held at the prison? And prior to being an inmate counsel, I worked at what's called 915 Warehouse. I was a receiving clerk there. And before then, I worked at uh, Camp J as a tier orderly. What, what do you think? Oh, let, me, let me go back. How old were you when? Uh, Miss Jordan was murdered. Uh, I was 29 years old. Okay. So from 29 to age 53, what's the most impactful thing that you've learned during your incarceration? Mm -hmm. Well, the most impactful. Let me tell you, Miss Jackson, this goes, this whole situation goes back to way before this with Latasha, I made a bad decision one day. And that bad decision, see, I was one of Jehovah's Witnesses. That bad decision was to put the Bible down and walk away. That led to all of this. And so <clears throat> in doing that, making that bad decision, every bad thing thereafter is a result of that, all the way up culminating in Latasha's death. And so I was removed from the congregation when I made that decision. I was just fellowship. Well, some years later, after I come to Angola, um, I turned things around and I wrote a lot of letters to the congregation. And finally, the elders met with me and reinstated me. And since that time, I've been a faithful servant of Jehovah. And my meetings, my family, they're all servants of Jehovah. That has been the most impactful thing, turning that around and getting back my life back in line with Bible principles. Uh, although you have no control over this, Mr. Vaughn, there is quite a bit of opposition uh, to your early release. Um, the judge who presided over your case, the district attorney who prosecuted it, all law enforcement entities, as well as the victim's family. And as I said, there's nothing that you can do about the fact that the opposition exists, but how would you address those people who feel like it would not be appropriate to grant you early uh, a commutation of sentence? Well, Ms. Jackson, I can tell you, I've longed for this day to express this because my voice has not been heard and I've wanted to express to everyone involved, especially the Jordan family, how sorry I am for hurting them. I know that sorry is not a strong enough word. I can say a thousand sorries and it would never ever undo the pain I've caused the Jordan family and everyone who has touched this case. Um, I've agonized over this 
So day in and day out, I wake up with it. I take it to bed with me. Um, see, the Jordan family trusted me with Latasha. When Latasha was with me, they weren't worried. I betrayed them in the worst way. And I feel horrible about that. Horrible. I know them all. Um, I wish I could undo the pain I've caused them. I wish that nobody had to consider this case, the judge, the DA, law enforcement, everybody who was involved in this, everybody was hurt in some way. It had a negative ripple effect that goes on to infinity. And I, I, I just feel terrible about it. And I wish that I could undo it. Um, the Jordan family, I know the pain. I'm a victim myself. I lost somebody near and dear to me years ago, and I still feel it today. And I hate that I inflicted the same pain on them. Again, you know, you can't change the facts of the case. And I recognize that. But I'll tell you one of the things that makes this case especially difficult was that uh, Ms. Jordan was nine months pregnant. And so in committing this crime, not only did you end her life, uh, you ended the life of a baby that was pretty much full term. And I think it's difficult for us to imagine uh, what your mindset was that would allow you to beat a pregnant woman to death in light of, especially in light of the fact that that child could very well have been your child. And I think you're gonna to have to help us understand that because I know I'm struggling with it and I would imagine that there are others who are struggling with it. So I need some help trying to understand, was it rage? What, what was it that would, because I don't think you were defending yourself. You know, anybody who's been pregnant and in their ninth month can't pose much of a threat to a, a man in his late 20s. So you're gonna have to help me understand what, what you believe it was that fueled this, this really terrible thing. <sighs> Well, like I said before, I've been trying to understand it just like you. You know, she was pregnant with Skylar. Um, there were a lot of things that transpired between me and Latasha leading up to that time. Uh, this was not the first physical altercation. Well, I never hit her. I never attacked her. I never did anything to her, but she attacked me a lot uh, over the years, is what I say over the years, in times prior to that. And I would successfully restrain her a lot of times, hold her, you know, to keep her from when she'd go off in a rage, whatever. She didn't want me to leave her. And sometimes I, she'd get the best of me. Sometimes she would sneak me as the term goes. I guess uh, over time, all those things, um, I thought I was dealing with them on my own. Um, that night, when that happened, when she exploded, I guess I just flashed out and exploded myself. Um, like I said, it wasn't anything planned. I didn't, all I planned to do was talk to her, try to reason with her. I didn't plan to kill her. I didn't want Latasha dead. I didn't want the baby dead. I didn't want that. And I've been trying to understand why I didn't do this or why I didn't I do that. Why didn't I grab her? I, I, I can't wrap my mind around that and why. I lashed out like that. And I guess it was just from an accumulation of frustration over time. Um, yeah, she was she was nine months pregnant with Skylar. And I can tell you, Ms. Jackson, I don't have any children of my own. I've wanted children for a long time. I love children. And to, for me to know that I've done something like that 
it's so horrible. Scott didn't get to take his first breath. Miss Jordan didn't get a chance to play with her grandchild. Nobody got, took all that away from everybody. And I know that they're hurting, but I'm hurting too. I'm hurting a lot with them. I'm not looking for sympathy, but I hurt with them. I hurt for Skylar, I hurt for Latasha. I've been trying to process it. I've been trying to process it and understand. Like I said, it happened so fast, so fast. And I reacted, I reacted badly. I, I don't know, and I don't know if any of this helps you, but um, uh, I'm trying. That's, that's fine, Mr. Vaughn. Uh, tell me what your, if you were to receive clemency, what's your transition plan? <clears throat> well, um, I've gotten with the parole project and they're gonna help me in transition. They're in Baton Rouge, my family's in Baton Rouge. Uh, we own our home and that's where I'll end up living after the transit, after the parole project. Um, I have a job. I end up with uh, highest common highest common denominator media group. And I'll be um, working with them, archiving media and doing video work for them. Is that in Baton Rouge? Ma'am? Is that in Baton Rouge? No, ma'am, it's in Texas, but I'll be working from home over the computer. Um, we touched on, on maybe alcohol or drugs, maybe a little bit, but has that been an issue for you in the past? No, ma'am. Uh, have you ever used illegal drugs? Uh, when I was really young, I smoked marijuana a little bit and I would drink socially, but that was it. Okay. And no other uh, substance abuse issues? No, ma'am. Mrs. Renatza, uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Um, Mr. Roche. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Good afternoon, Mr. Bowen. How are you? Good afternoon, Mr. Roche. Good. Mr. Bowen, two and two is wow. not adding up to four for me this afternoon. You mentioned you were sorry about Scarlett. So that means you had plans for Ms. Jordan. You had already named your son. Uh, and you distinctly gave the unborn child a name. So that indicates to me that you had taken responsibility for the child and were planning with Ms. Jordan while living with another woman at the same time. Explain that to me. Uh, actually, Mr. Roche, uh, Latasha named the baby and she told me what the name was. I, I didn't know, I didn't name him. So tell me why you would stay in a relationship and I'm gonna use your words, with a sweet young lady, four and a half years, if she was as violent as she, you said she was. Well, she was very, when, when it was good in the beginning, it was very good. Tasha was very smart. She was very funny. And that's what caught my attention. But later on, as we went on in a relationship, I realized that you know, she had this other side and so when I tried to break it up, I kept trying to move on with my life. And what would look like a relationship really wasn't that toward the end. I would see her off and on when she wanted me to come and see her. But dating, I wouldn't call it dating. It was something else. It, it wasn't. And so I tried to move on with my life with someone else. And I tried to encourage her to do the same. Well, Mr. Vaughn, if she was nine months pregnant, you you cooperated with the relationship at least three and a half years. Something is not adding up. And question number 12, you shift the blame completely 
on the, on the victim. Years ago, I became romantically involved with a really sweet woman named Tasha Jordan. As time went by, I realized that she was far from being the nice person I thought she was. I discovered she had a violent streak. How long did it take you to discover that? Uh, I don't know exactly how long, sir. I don't know. Okay. Because of this, I tried to end the relationship and move on. However, she was obsessed, violent, and stalking me. All the blame is on the victim. Now the incident, yo, know, you got all from Georgia Pacific and met her at McDonald's on Harden Boulevard. Why was it necessary to go to a secluded place if you, all you wanted to do was talk? When we got to the McDonald's on Harding, there were a lot of young people kind of partying out in the parking lot. It was kind of loud and rambunctious out there. And so I told us, look, let's not stop here. Let's go to where we normally go down by the river. I'm very familiar with that McDonald's and there's that gigantic parking lot. So even if there were people on the parking lot, there's enough space in that particular parking lot where you could took a spot in the back of the parking lot and had a conversation. Why did you feel it necessary to go to a secluded place behind the levee in downtown Baton Rouge? Well, it was quieter. Like I said, over there at the McDonald's at night, I don't know what was going on around Southern at that time, but there was a lot of activity in the parking lot that night. Okay. okay. Yeah. But what I'm saying is you could have sat in one of the cars and had the conversation. I don't know that down by the river is where we where we've gone before many times to talk, and so it just that's the next thing that came to mind. You look like you're pretty physically fit guy. Um, at 29 years old, I'm almost sure you are also a physical specimen, and I'm agree with Miss Jackson. My wife has been pregnant three times. And at nine months, she wasn't capable of even swinging her hand in defense if something was coming at her. You said she attacked you, knocked you down. How is this possible? Well, she hit me in the face. And I wasn't ready for it. I wasn't expecting it. She hit me. Sitting down, sitting down on the tailgate of a truck, she must have enough energy, nine months pregnant, to knock you to the ground at 29 years old. Yes, sir, it's what happened. Okay. What happened. Um, I, I, I don't like the way that you filled out your application and shifted blame to everybody but yourself. <clears throat> and if you were aware that this was a, a volatile relationship, you should have ended. But you didn't and you went into another relationship while this relationship was going on. I'm sorry, Mr. Vaughn, but some of the things that you're telling us this afternoon just doesn't add up. And uh, the first step to your rehabilitation is to take full responsibility for your actions. Even though that you term for your 
first degree feticide had expired, that unborn baby was a victim. And you didn't even recognize it in the application. And I understand why you didn't, but a remorseful individual would have made some note of that. I'm gonna sit back and I'm gonna listen, but I have serious concerns that we are not getting the full picture of what happened. And I know the crime happened 24 years ago. And the most important thing today is your rehabilitation. But you also must remember that the victims play a part in this process. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Roche. Warden Falgu, is there any comments from Mangold? Um, you know, since, since Sean has been here, um, he made the, uh, the, men, the men a uh, trustee status back in uh, June of 06. Um, he has consistently worked and uh, worked, worked hard at both uh, dealing with the uh, MA Council and as a uh, an employee with the with the television station, um, he's he's done a, a tremendous amount of work for us here um, with public service for different things that we've asked him to do over time with COVID with a lot of different things. Um, so since he has been here, he's he's provided you know well for us and has helped us out. All right, thank you. Uh, Ms. Roden, can you, can you introduce those who've indicated they'd like to speak today? Yes, ma'am. First, we're gonna hear from Charles German, a friend of the family. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chairman and board members. Um, to start with, I would like to personally express to the family and the friends of the victim that it, I am sincerely sorry for the pain and the loss that you have endured over the years. Uh, as we're speaking about Sean Vaughn, I heard a lot about Sean well before I met him in person, uh, not just from his family, but from his friends and acquaintances. And uh, I was told about Sean as being, and they presented him as being a kind, loving, humble person that cares for others and looks out for the welfare of others. So upon meeting Sean for the first time, which was during a prison ministry session or visit, I found then and with my further visits that I had made that he was the person that I heard about. He was very kind and considerate and uh, he played a, a big part and was very instrumental in organizing the meetings that we had as Jehovah's Witnesses and we go and have the ministry sessions. And I noticed that it was very well respected by those other attendees that were incarcerated. So he seemed to have a very outstanding positive influence on others. Also, in my conversations with Sean and his family, I feel convinced he is a different person than what I've heard today and that he is extremely remorseful and tremendously regretful of the event that cost the life of another person. And I really got to know Sean by his family. His family loved him, uh, Tina, his wife, Keisha, his stepdaughter, Conrad, his son-in-law. Uh, they support him and they've seen a different person over the years. They've been supporting him for 24 plus years. And they're all eager to have Sean come home and they have made the appropriate uh, measures uh, to welcome him home into their family. As far as coming home, I know the family very well. Sean's environment is a very warm place to be. It's inviting, they're very supportive of others. Tina, Keisha, and Conrad, they're very eager not only to assist Sean, but they've already been very active for decades in helping others and assisting either in a spiritual aspect or in a humanitarian aspect. And these are kind, loving people and they have built a trust with Sean over the years that they feel like they can, uh, they're convinced that he is 
not the person that we heard about today. In conclusion, uh, as for myself, I look forward to assisting Sean in his rehabilitation, just as a mentor, as a, a friend, someone in the congregation, and supporting his family and moving forward to continue to be productive members in society. That's what I know of the family and that's what I know of Sean. And I don't really have and never have had heard anything negative other Mr. than- Mr. Sean, can, can, can you please conclude your statement? This thank is you. it, thank you. Okay, thank you. Next, we're gonna hear from Jonathan Stack. Yeah, I had good afternoon, everybody. And thanks for giving this time. And it's a, you know, a pleasure to see Cheryl Renatza and some of the people I've known over the years. I, I myself am a documentary filmmaker and I've been working with people from Angola with the administration since the mid nineties and have been asked on many occasions to come to speak on behalf of inmates. And this is the first time I decided to do so. And it was not an easy decision, but, but um, Sean's just somebody that I've come to know over the years because of his work with the LSPTV. And he's just a uniquely kind person and a thoughtful person. I mean, just on any level. And it's horrible to hear about the crime and to hear all the details, And but it sickens me. I'm sure it sickens him. I feel for the family. I, don't, I know the job you guys have is really difficult ahead of you to make this decision. But in a way, like Sean just doesn't, you know, I've always noticed like, something that most media doesn't tell you about, which is just how much care and concern is given by the staff and the administration to help these men turn their lives around and go from where they enter the gates to where they're worthy of coming out. And, and in a way, Sean's transformation and all the incredible things he's done over the years is a reflection of all that hard work that people at Angola do does. And, and, and in a way, it's like his being approved him is like, in a way is also approving all of that effort and all that work that's been done and all the people who've known him and supported him. So I'm just here to say, I, I, I know that if he gets out, he'll do great. And I know that if he gets out, him and I will be working together. I'm part of HCD and we will look forward to hopefully being able to work with Sean as he supported us in the many years we've worked in Angola prison. That's all I wanted to say. I know it's a tough decision, but this is a man who's, who, if anybody's worthy of a chance, I really believe in Sean Vaughn. Thank you, Mr. Stack. Next, we'll hear from Norris Henderson. Good afternoon. Uh, I just want to share some light on how I met Sean. I met Sean when Sean first arrived in Angola and uh, kind of like helped Sean try to find his way. And uh, he was there, fresh life sentence, and trying to advise him about not serving time, but let time serve him. And Sean has kind of like stepped up to the plate. I, 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 I'm just like Jonathan, we've heard all the, the facts. Uh, can none of us change none of that, but I can vouch for who Sean is as an individual. One of the other things that came out during Ms. Jackson's uh, 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 questioning of Sean is about the documentary work that he's done. Sean's work actually helped us uh, change some of the legislation that's been changed over from 2017 forward because Sean was able to document all the lifers inside and outside who had become successful. And we use that kind of like as the, the presentation to the legislators about opportunities for folks who have been long-term, have served long sentences and had a life sentence and that there was a possibility that their rehabilitation was just what it was. What you saw is what you get. I had also the opportunity to meet his wife, Tina, uh, our organization uh, during this time, our concession provided kind of like wraparound services for folks who, uh, you know, the administration allowed to get married and stuff like that. And so I'm kind of like the guy who catered pretty much their wedding and stuff like that. And I know sometimes people say, well, what they got to do with anything? The thing what it was is that he made a, a conscious decision is now that I know, even given the circumstances, what caused him to be in prison, that he made a commitment. And I think that commitment, and even today that Sean and Tina is still together, trying to hold, make a life out of what life or uh, existence that he actually has in prison, speaks volume in the sense that 
somebody has turned the corner in a sense about how you prioritize what's important. And I think it goes back to something Mr. Roche was asking also about how could you do one thing and do something else? And that's the question that we always ask ourselves, that how do we find ourselves in situations that sometimes in hindsight, we say, oh, could have completely been avoided. Uh, but at the time that they happened, we just didn't use the best judgment that we had. But like I said, again, Sean, just like Johnson said, there's an opportunity for Sean. Sean has skills that our organization could use, uh, not only his radio, uh, skills, but also his television production skills. And uh, we would be willing to hire Sean any event that his transition has to take place somewhere else. If he couldn't live in Baton Rouge, uh, we would be willing to bring Sean on as a part of our staff. And as the board know, 9% of our staff are from incarcerated folks who have been served tremendous amounts of time and between our organization and the parole project in the first 72, we can provide all the wraparound Henderson, services. Can we please get you to conclude your statement? Yes, ma'am. And you. so we can provide the wraparound services to Sean in the event that the board grants him mercy. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Kerry Myers will speak next. Uh, thank you, good afternoon. Kerry Myers, Louisiana Parole Project. Um, I'm not going to repeat for the sake of, of, of time all the things uh, Sean has accomplished. I think that's well documented. Um, I can tell you that Pearl Project is here to support Sean through his transition, um, whatever that transition may be, fully support him. I'll also tell you that I've known Sean for more than 20 years and I've worked with him uh, as media uh, uh, at Angola. We have worked on many projects together. I can tell you that before Sean even joined the television station, he had uh, been in positions of trust at every job he had as a receiving clerk, uh, an exceptional position of trust to control inventory coming in, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of inventory. As an inmate counsel substitute, um, your conduct record had to be beyond reproach uh, to hold that position. Uh, and as his the job at the TV station, uh, Sean and I, I can tell you that we went on many uh, projects outside of the prison that were um, uh, with the most minimal of security um, and doing the work that we needed to do. So Sean has been in a position of trust. Sean committed a crime, a serious crime uh, that that I know he thinks about every single day. Um, and I know that he wished if he, he could change it, he would. Uh, but I don't believe, and if you look at Sean and you look at his his Tiger scores, his risk level. I don't believe Sean has a criminal mentality. That's not who he was. Uh, he, he was gainfully employed. Uh, he was a good son. He you know, uh, led a normal life. Sean reacted badly, as he said, and, and he's still trying to figure it out, how he reacted so badly to a, to a situation. Uh, he, may never, he may never get that answer. Uh, but I do, I do believe Sean would be a very productive person in society. He has, he has the skills. Uh, in the years that I've known him, I've only known Sean to extend kindness to people, uh, to help people where he can, um, to look out for others first. Even his, his position at television station, he looked out for, for his staff there, uh, in many cases, uh, before himself. So I can tell you that that's the Sean that I know. Um, the Sean that committed the crime is not the Sean that you see here today. Uh, he's not the worst moment of his life. And I would ask this board to consider uh, granting him a recommendation today. Thank you, Mr. Myers. Next, we'll go to the opposition side. We'll start with Ms. Nawatha Simpson, the victim's sister. Um, thank you guys for hearing me out today. Um, um, everyone that's here on behalf of Sean, you know, it just kind of reminds me, I have three kids and if I tell my kids to clean their room, you know, they're going to be rewarded. That's kind of what, you know, it just sounds like to me. Um, I just want to touch on the altercation since he brought it up. It actually wasn't anything that I want to speak about, but he said that me and my sister attacked him. That was false. Um, no one hit anyone. Um, if anything, I was there to make sure that it didn't happen because Tasha was eight months pregnant. And if at any point Sean felt threatened, um, 
the a restraining order should have been placed on us then, but he waited two weeks later. Actually, the day after he murdered her, he went and put a restraining order on me and my deceased sister. So if he felt like we was a threat, I don't know why he would wait two weeks to do that. Um, as far as him saying that it wasn't planned, the meeting was not a casual meeting for you just to uh, break it off with her because you left work in the middle of your shift. Your manager was there to testify that they could not find you for a while. So this wasn't just a casual meeting. I think it was a plan that you thought about and you carried out with your plan. My sister was in the way of you and the other woman's relationship. And obviously you wanted her and her, you wanted her gone. Um, and people who've never lost anyone that don't understand the grieving process is not something that goes away. We grieve daily. You know, we have nightmares. I don't know if you're going to come back and try to get me and my family. Like we fear that daily. Like we don't know what the fact that you even brought up the, the altercation makes me wonder, do you, uh, you know, what are your plans when you get out? Like I, I fear for my life. I don't know. I have nightmares about that. I don't know if you're going to come back and try to harm my family. So we're still grieving. This is this is nothing that will never go away. All my kids have are the memories of their, their aunt. They never met her. Um, you have to wonder why certain times of the year. My sister, her birthday is in two days. Tasha would have made 47 years old. But you took all of that away from us. Um, so I'm not going to dwell on it. I'm going to let my mom and my sister talk. But we just ask that justice continues to be served. And, John, um, and Sean stays in prison to carry out the rest of his sentence because again my family doesn't know what your intentions are for us if, if you get out thank you miss simpson and let me remind those on the opposition side to please uh, make your comments to the board not to the offender okay let's go with miss jacqueline jordan next uh the uh, mother of the victim good afternoon it's hard and it's tough for me to sit here and listen to it. Lord, I'm having a hard time, Jesus. I'm having a hard time with this. My heart hurts so bad. How can somebody take the life of not one but two people and expect for the family to have the understanding to let them I can't see it. God knows I can't. I feel like right now I'm about to have a heart attack and I hope I don't because I just buried a child in January. And if anything should happen to me, I don't know what my kids are going to do. But God, all I ask is that you guys do not, do not in the name of Jesus, let Sean Vaughn go free because if it was your child, I want you to tell me what would you do? Would you set him free? Oh God, just let him stay where he is and serve his turn. Because every time I look at these children, I think about Skylar, I think about Tasha, and it's rough. January the 12th is going to be the worst day of my life again this year. I don't have anything else to say, but God, please. Find it in your heart to not to let this victim out because there are victims out here every day killing somebody else's child. And I know they're going through the same pain that I feel right now. I have nothing else to say. Oh my God. Thank you, Ms. Jordan. Um, next, we'll go with Ms. Yolanda Allen, the victim's sister. <laughs> Ms. Allen, can we get you to unmute your mic, please? Hello? Yes, ma'am. We can make your statement. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, okay, we, I, I have sit here and I have listened over and over about Sean being this good guy before prison. Now he's just awesome guy since he didn't done time. I don't feel, I don't feel it's time. 
he 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 sat here and he still can't take total responsibility of his actions. Sean knew, he knew that Tasha and the baby was no threat to him. He was over there all the time. Tasha was just in his way. You that he he gets to he gets to come home and continue with his life, and we 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 have to go to the grave to visit my sister and the baby. It's, it's just he did he he murdered my sister and my nephew, and he, that's he needs to spend the rest of his life in in prison. I don't feel he needs to be set free. Set free to do what? If he was a good guy before he went to jail. Never had any problems. He's a good guy now. He snapped. He can snap again. What 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 can say? Anything can trigger him. And what we'll be back listening to. Oh, well, Sean was a good guy. No, I don't. I don't buy that. I think Sean should continue serving his time. And that's all I really have to say. Thank you, Miss Allen. Okay, and then next we'll hear from Miss Tracy Barbera with the East Baton Rouge District Attorney's Office. Good afternoon. Despite Mr. Vaughn telling you he did not want to get into victim blaming, that's exactly what he did. He, I find to him to be a very disingenuous individual in his comments to you today, very self-centered, very self-serving. I have heard the descriptions that his supporters have offered to you this morning or this afternoon, but that is not the person that appeared before you this afternoon. He is, he says he's sorry. I think he's sorry because he's been in prison for 24 and a half years instead of out and about doing what he wants to do. And I just, I did not see any sincere remorse from this man. And I believe his sorrow is for himself and on behalf of the victim's families and on behalf of the victim. I mean, the fact that he's only been in jail 24 and a half years, I realized the two sentences were to run concurrent, but 15 of those were for the baby. And that leaves only nine and a half years for his mama. And I just don't understand what kind of man can attack an eight month pregnant woman. Uh, that's a sign of his true character. And we ask that you deny his request. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thanks everybody for, for all your uh, comments and participation. Um, before we turn it over to Mr. Lancaster, Sean, do you have a statement you'd like to make to the board? I don't have anything prepared. It's just, um, I've heard everyone speak and I know I said I'm sorry. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. And I know that the family is hurting. I've been wanting to reach out to them for so long. There's so much I don't understand. Uh, I know there's so much they don't understand, but I hope at some point that they, they can heal and that, that they can somehow forgive me one day. Um, if they don't, I understand. But I want everyone to know that this was not a planned event, that I never wanted to bring any harm to Latasha or Skylar. I didn't want the family to hurt. This was not a plan. This was something that happened suddenly, very suddenly. And I've regretted it every day. Not that I regret being incarcerated. Of course, nobody wants to be in prison. I regret that I've caused so many people so much pain that have hurt so many people. And like I said before, this um, started with me and a bad decision I made before Latasha. And that night and prior to that, I made a lot of bad decisions, very bad decisions. It all falls on me, no matter what transpired between me and Latasha. It all falls on me. I made decisions, I made bad decisions. I reacted badly you know, and I can't change it. I wish I could. And for the board members, you, know, you don't, I know some things are hard to understand. They're hard to understand for me. And um, I just want to say that I apologize to everyone involved, everybody, because I've heard everybody. All right, thank you. Mr. Lancaster. Good afternoon. Um, Sean is well known in the Angola community. He has a um, large and important presence there. Um, I actually met Sean uh, 
number of years ago when I first uh, started going to Angola doing this work, uh, given the work that, that he's done at Angola. And I know down the walk, um, uh, men in Angola uh, look up to Sean and uh, understand and appreciate what he's accomplished. The, the, the facts about where Sean is today in his life uh, indicate that he's institutionally compliant. Uh, he has only three write-ups uh, during his 24 and a half years in prison. Uh, that, that's remarkable uh, and also recognized by institutional staff. They've recognized that in the jobs that they've given to Sean over the years. All of the jobs have been positions of trust uh, so the administration at the prison have recognized that in Sean uh, uh, for a very long time, even prior to his Class A trustee status in 2006, which he has maintained consistently uh, throughout all of his time in prison. Um, I know some information came out at the hearing today about Sean's work at the television station, uh, his work in video. Uh, him assisting in documentaries that have been done uh, inside of the prison and outside of the prison. Um, the significance of the impact of that work, I know, was touched on at the hearing. The potential for continued you know, impact of that work, should Sean be released, uh, I think is extremely important to recognize as well. But also important in that work is over the course of all of those uh, uh, jobs that he's had doing video work, uh, and I know he provided a list to the board prior to this hearing, over 50 of those um, you know, placements have been outside of the prison, uh, traveling to New Orleans, traveling to Baton Rouge, doing work at headquarters, uh, and often in those trips, uh, you know, doing that work under very minimal supervision, again, indicating the institution's trust in Sean uh, uh, to do uh, that, that work. Uh, as mentioned, he has a very low TIGER score, so the risk assessment that the Department of Corrections has put in place uh, to measure the likelihood of recidivi recidivism indicates that Sean is a really good risk uh, for early release. Um, and uh, so that recognized tool, uh, Sean, is, is, is very low risk on. Um, also, this is a crime as horrific as it is. It's a crime of unique circumstance, uh, very uh, likely, unlikely to uh, 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 be repeated. Um, Sean has a very strong reentry plan. He's got the support of the parole project. He's got the, the, the support of First 72 Plus in New Orleans. Uh, he's got employment lined up. Uh, as well as a, a permanent residence to go to should he be released. Uh, for all of these reasons, uh, we request that uh, the board uh, recommend commutation of sentence um, to 99 years with immediate parole eligibility. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lancaster. All right, I think that's, uh, that's everybody. I think is the, is the board prepared to vote? We'll start with Ms. Jackson. Well, Ms. Renaz, I'd like to move for executive session. All right, we have a motion for executive session to discuss confidential matters. Madam Chairman, I'll second the motion. We have a second. Is there any uh, objection? No. All right, we'll be in uh, executive session for just a few moments <clears> folks, <throat> to discuss confidential matters. Stand by, we'll be right back. Okay, I'm gonna just skip ahead so we don't have to wait, but it was only about a two and a half minute executive session, which is relatively short for hearing at this length. What do you think they're going to do? Let's see. All right. Here we go. All right. We're back. I think uh, we don't have the DA back. There we are. So we've got everybody back in. Uh, we're, we are um, Back in regular session, we are prepared to vote. And we'll start with Ms. Jackson. All right, Mr. Vaughn, um, I'll, I'll tell you that this is a very, very hard case. It really is. You know, 
um, the crime was was just really incomprehensible. And even you indicate that you can't understand you know, how you could have done such a heinous and terrible thing. Um, and so it's it's a struggle. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna, there are a lot of things that are positive on your behalf, an awful lot of things that are positive on your behalf. Uh, you've only had three write-ups. You have a low risk score. You have been uh, active within the prison community and you have done a lot of good work. However, uh, it's not just about you. Okay? Uh, it's also about uh, the impact that you've had on on other people and there's nothing that you can do about that but certainly the board has a responsibility to take into consideration uh the impact of your release uh on the victims as well um i think that um there will be a day where you will be successful in your attempt at a commutation because I think you will continue to do the good things that you're doing so far. And my hope is that, uh, because my vote today will be to deny you, but my hope is that when you're eligible to apply again and you apply, that maybe you'll have a, 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 a greater understanding of, of why you did this. It, it, it bothers me, I have to say, because I feel like maybe you're not being completely candid with us, or maybe you're not being completely candid with yourself. Maybe the truth is too hard. I don't know. Uh, but today, uh, based on uh, the strong victim opposition uh, in this case, uh, my vote today, as well as law enforcement opposition, uh, my vote today would be to uh, deny your request for a commutation. But keep up the good work. Uh, don't let this be an discouragement, uh, because I think there will come a day when you will get a different outcome. Mr. Roche. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Mr. Vaughn, I'm not going to repeat everything Mrs. Jackson has said. I'm just going to say that I echo every word she stated in her decision. Um, I don't think you were quite truthful and you misrepresented some of the facts of the case in your applying at your application and in your interview today. The reasons I'm denying you is not because of the crime. It's because I think you've not been completely truthful in the process from filing the application until the day. And Ms. Jackson may have put it in the right perspective. Maybe you hadn't come to the realization of what you actually did. Sometimes to protect oneself, we sort of change the version of what actually happened to protect your inner self. So the next time you apply, try to get the facts straight and apply with the realization that you're going to actually tell the panel what happened and your accomplishments will take care of the rest. 
you have accomplished so much while incarceration, but I don't think you've accomplished full rehabilitation because you hadn't come to grips with exactly your crime involved and what effect it had on your family and the victim's family. I wish you the best of luck. Mr. Marabella. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I'd like to say to the family of the victims who testified here today, uh, I thank you for your courage. And I certainly sympathize with the grief in what you've said here today. It has not gone unlistened to. Uh, with reference to Mr. Vaughn, Mr. Vaughn, I have looked at the facts of this case and there is no doubt these facts are horrible. Uh, uh, and one of the factors that we take into account uh, or several factors that we take into account is the crime itself and as well, the opposition from the victims and from law enforcement. But what our role is and, and really is, is to see not who you were back then, but who you are today and what you've accomplished. Uh, if we only judged a person's ability to get out on the crime that he or she committed, then we might not let anybody out. The crimes are horrible. And certainly this one ranks very, very high amongst those. Uh, the fact that, that you may not have been completely honest about what some of us believe really happened and what didn't happen, I, I think those are, as Mr. Roche points out, sometimes psychological defenses that uh, keep us from uh, admitting certain things. Uh, I am completely understand and believe you are remorseful and uh, about what you did and you recognize what you've done to the family of the victim in this case. You have done some tremendous work while you've been in prison. You are a low risk, you are very trusted, uh, you have a good prison record, uh, you have an excellent disciplinary record and good comments by the warden. Uh, my vote would be today to grant your commutation to 99 years and make you immediately eligible for parole. Uh, that would be my vote. Uh, Madam Chairman, That's uh, that would be my vote. Thank you, Mr. Mirabella. Well, Sean, you, you know where you're at. You know where you stand now because you need a unanimous favorable decision. But I, I'm going to tell those of you who are here with us today, you know, if my vote would in any way uh, minimize the, the uh, pain experienced by the victim's family and, and Sean's family, uh, who I consider victims as well, um, or bring Skylar or Tasha back, I would vote that way. Uh, my sympathies to the victim's family. I too lost a close, very close family member to violence. And I know that grief never goes away, ever. Um, but, my job is today is to look at who Sean is. And I'm very familiar with Sean having spent a lot of time at Angola. I'm familiar with his work in most of his jobs, uh, but it particularly in the law library and with the TV station. And I know that Sean is remorseful for what happened. I know that he is not the same person who came to prison in the, in the late nineties. He's done some incredible work. I am confident that if he, whenever he is granted relief, that he will be a good citizen and that he's gonna make a positive impact on the community where he lands. My vote today would be to grant his uh, request, recommend a commutation to 99 years with immediate parole eligibility. So Sean, you've received two votes to deny your application, two votes to grant. So the outcome today is that your application for clemency has been denied. I do encourage you to keep up the good work, reapply when you're eligible to do so. Thanks to everyone who participated this afternoon. Thank you. 
I like to think, I tell myself, I tell myself that Mr. Marybell is only granting just because he knew that he couldn't get denied, but really, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm just so grateful that Ms. Jackson and Mr. O'Shea were there to handle this interview because otherwise the frustration could have been. Actually, a lot of things I think went well in terms of how interviews go. Uh, they held him to the fire. Miss Jackson had her mic drop. Mr. O'Shea had his mic drop. My favorite DA had her mic drop. The uh, the the supporters the, the they're always so like, you know, they, they always come in rambling, 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 rambling. And then immediately after they talk, then you hear real emotion. You hear real pain from the family. We see this so often. It's like they have no shame. And I love how my favorite DA came in there and said, you know, the man who they, who his supporters spoke about, that's not the man who we saw here at this interview. And that's because they always say the same thing, the supporters. It's all, oh, he's such a great director. He's so great. And we'll go over some of his stuff. I was thinking whether I should or not, but Richard shared with him, yeah, he, he has a lot of work that's actually seems to have made it places. Um, but who cares? <laughs> I mean, like, who cares? I, just, I, I do love that that Louise, that that uh, they, they cut off every single one of the supporters except for Randy Meyer because he's at least smart enough to keep it short. But the other rambling morons, I'll call them that. I, I really, I, I, it's like being, it's like, it's like they're all, the, the supporters are also just like, it's like they're, they're tone deaf. It's like, do you realize what happened? Do you realize what he did? I don't understand how someone shows up to a commutation hearing and their strategy, even though he's highly intelligent, he's surrounded by people who would have given him advice on what to do and what not to do. And yet he doesn't even bring up his, probably his unborn child, he doesn't, he, 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 his strategy is to say that he was being attacked by her. He was in fear of his life. He, that was his approach. Are you mad? I mean, you just can't make this stuff up. I love how Mr. O'Shea gave the example about how his wife wouldn't even be able to. And it's it, it, it's like, yeah, she's nine months pregnant. You're afraid to the point where you have to end her life. And the un, your, probably your unborn child. And not only that, but then you drag her reputation through the mud. It's like as if we're forgetting the fact that you killed her and her child. You lured her to a spot in a parking lot, all as much as you want to deny it, and killed them. And then you're going to say that she was crazy? That she was really stalkerish? And what was it that they said that he filed a restraining order after he had killed them? I don't have any court documents to share with you. I wish I did. I wish that I had some type of information that I can dive more into the details, but I don't. But he goes on to say that she attacked me. What was it? Was Miss Jackson say that at the end? Maybe the truth is too hard for you to talk about, and it's like, what? Uh, what other truths can there be? You killed her. It, it it seems to me that you're with an yeah. So <laughs> I mean, I'm sure she was mad as any pregnant woman who is carrying your child will be. <laughs> But so, but that has nothing to do. Like what? So now you're afraid for your life, and you're going to kill her. And he and he drags her through the mud at at, at this commutation hearing. Just like oh, it, it sounded like 
you know, it sounded like a guy talking about how his his, his crazy ex, you know, except for trying to forget the point that he's sitting in prison for killing him and her child, who he claims so practically, yeah, I don't even know if it was my child. You know what's bizarre is that his wife, so the woman he, he was cheating on her with, he's still with her. She stayed with him. There are pictures of, of her in, in these uh, Angola papers that Richard shared with me. Isn't that something, huh? Where is it? Here it is. If I'm remembering this correctly. This is the ang the angolate, they call it. Richard finds everything, right? After the screening, Cohen discusses the audience reaction to image Sean, one of the film's co-directors in photography, and his wife, Tina. That's and that's the name they mentioned. That's the woman. So so she stayed with him, even though he killed his even though he killed someone even though he murdered two people that's a real great choice you know it's this stuff you just can't you, you just wouldn't believe it if you didn't see it it, it what I think what what gets me could just so confused is how does someone how is someone so narcissistic and so oh, but and, and he he's clearly intelligent and he really thinks that that's the strategy to go in there and blame and say that he was being attacked by her it's just nuts so here he is and i was really contemplating even showing it because like it's like i just don't care but I think that the context might be helpful and they talk him up, man. They talk him up. I mean, Sean came to Louisiana penitentiary in 1998 as a first time offender serving a life sentence for murder and also for killing, you know, he really is double murder, right? What they, I know they classify it differently. He's the producer of uh, LSB TV Angola's closed circuit television station. He has produced numerous training and instructional videos for Angola, Louisiana Department of Corrections, Louisiana Department of Probation and Parole, and has appeared in the program such as MSNBC's Lockup, Inside Angola, and The Farm, 10 Down and 210. It goes on and on and on. And he does have, um, he made this, and I, I'm not going to play it because I'm, I'm just too concerned about copyright stuff, but it's really highly produced. It's, uh, this is the trailer for the documentary on the Oprah Winfrey Network. Um, and he's one of the four directors of this. So, yeah, he does have, uh, he's, he's gifted at making film. And he's just not gifted at um, seeing how, really, I think, what a monster he is. And what it, how disgusting it looks to hear him come up with his little stories and oh my gosh to hear his the grandmother the mother to lose her daughter and an unborn grandchild on the same day and then have to sit here and see this guy drag her daughter through the mud that and, and you know when she said that i don't want to have a heart attack i might have it i that was so painful and i just was so grateful that tracy was there and i could not imagine anyone offering commutation for someone after hearing the family speak. But at least he was denied. And I don't know, you know, this hearing took place, I think, in 2022. So we might see him again in a couple of years. But we also have a new parole board at the time of this recording. I haven't seen them yet, but this is March 18th. I'm recording this. They're coming on live for the first time March 19th. So I am excited to see them. And we'll start to see if this board will commute monsters like this or not. But thank you. On that note, dear Richard's going into surgery today, and I hope he's doing okay. That 
I'll let you go.